They are 15 years old and are getting ready to reach the United States from Mexico, preparing to travel 3,000 kilometers on a freight train. Look, there's a train that stopped over there. Let's go. Joao and Rafael have fled Honduras where their lives were in danger. They are traveling alone with no money. They know that this journey could cost them their lives, but they're ready to do anything to reach the United States. Do you think it will be a train like that we'll get on? Look, we could put ourselves here, we'll be safe. But up there, isn't it hot? Getting on and off a moving train has caused the deaths of hundreds of migrants, including increasing numbers of miners. Despite the risks, over the last three years, tens of thousands of teenagers have attempted this journey. The young migrants who are trying to take the train for the first time are given some advice. You must never try to catch the train head on. If the train is going that way, for example, you catch it with your right hand and run by its side like that. And then you put your first foot on. Most importantly, never let go. Because if you fall, the train sucks you under and you're dead. But once on the train, the worst is yet to come. Armed gangs extort money from the migrants. If you see guys getting on the train with machetes or guns, you lie on the floor and you don't move. And you stay still. Give them everything you have, don't even hesitate. Give them your rucksack. Don't resist or they'll kill you straight away. The train only passes once a day. You can see the fear in their eyes, the hesitation, before the jump that could cost them their lives. Fear of a fatal fall or severed legs. So there are some who jump, some who still hesitate. But for those who have never caught a moving train, it's going too fast. Joao, Rafael, Anthony and the other teenagers didn't dare. Too dangerous. We'll see if we can take the next one. If it's going more slowly, we'll have to wait, but that one was too risky. Will the next train be the right one? Will Joao, Rafael, Anthony and their friends make it to the United States? Teenage migrants are the new challenge for America. With stunning breaking news, a massive surge of illegal immigrants is underway right now, and we do mean massive. Over 5,000 children and teenagers have been arrested each month in the United States for two years. The Americans have nicknamed them the Dreamers, teenagers running away from the extreme violence of gangs in Central America, traveling without their parents and ready to face any dangers. It's their story that we're going to tell, that of Joao and Anthony, 15 years old. They've decided to take the freight train that crosses Mexico up to the border with the United States. We need to be really awake on the train. If you fall, you're dead. After the train, there is the border with the United States to be crossed on foot. We'll be following Juan and Jesus, two cousins. They are 15. Their family has paid a smuggler to get them across the desert. To get each illegal immigrant across the border, I get $1,000. Drugs make even more money, but we make a lot with migrants. Walk behind me. And here's what is waiting for them on the American side. Private militia who hunt migrants in the desert. It's a big game. We're just trying to play along with them. Yo, network. Yo, we got activity. Base camp. This is uh, over. Oh, yeah, they're right there. 
three, four, eight. They went over the river fence in this. If they aren't arrested, the migrants get lost and die of thirst in the desert, by the thousands, all to a general indifference. Young girls are kidnapped and disappear. They have fallen prey to smugglers and Mexican cartels, and some of them end up forced into prostitution. But for the first time, illegal immigrants who have managed to cross the border have decided to weigh in on the American presidential campaign. Millions of Latino illegal immigrants who are reclaiming what Obama promised them, to escape their illegal status. What place will the Americans give to these young migrants who also dream of quickly becoming legal? Their journey starts in the south of Mexico, at the border with Guatemala, in the Chiapas. The teenagers left Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, a few days earlier to reach Palenque, their first step to Mexico. They arrived by foot, by bus. Palenque, a small town that runs along the railway line. It's where the train going north leaves from, heading to the United States, a freight train that the migrants have nicknamed the Beast. The quickest and cheapest means of transport, but also the most dangerous, and thousands of young teenagers use it. This evening, we meet them in a guest house that is run by volunteers who are helping them, just next to the train lines. They all come from Honduras, Zhao, 15, has left his mother and little brother behind him. Anthony, 15 as well, had death threats from local gangs. First I crossed all of Guatemala. How long did it take you from the border? At least 15 or 16 hours. I walked day and night to get here, from the border two days and one night in a row, at least 25 hours. At home in Honduras, there's a war for territory between gangs. They kill families, children. What they like is killing. Thousands of teenagers have passed through this refuge in the last two years. They find a little help and rest there before crossing all of Mexico. Hi, Mum. It's me. Where are you at the moment? Honestly, I'm too scared to take the train. But I'm going to do it. I've no choice. No question of going back to Honduras. There's nothing there for me now. There's just you and my little brother. That's all. Damn, it cut off. I forgot to tell them to say a prayer for me so that I'm not afraid to take the train. It terrifies me. It's too big, too fast. What we want is to get to the end, arrive there, we'll do everything we can. A freight train is leaving a bit before midnight. Zhao, Anthony, Raphael and their new friends are waiting. This time they can't let the train go by without getting on board. They only have two euros in their pockets. Earlier I was super scared, but now I'm better. Before I was alone, but now I've made friends, which is more reassuring. It motivates you more. The thing is that we never know what time the train leaves, but we're going to get the next one. <laughs> my dream is to be able to help my family to have a real job, save as much as possible and one day go back to Honduras to have a quiet life. I can't stop thinking about the train, guys. I hope it's not going to be too dangerous. I know that the most important thing is to stay awake when we're on it, because if you sleep, you fall, and then we're really going to have to stay awake the whole time. After five hours of waiting, their second opportunity arrives. The night train goes less quickly, so a chance for the young migrants to get on board more easily. We can do this. I'm going. I've got to meet my mates.
The group of friends has decided to do everything they can to stay together, but Jiao is impatient to get on board as well. The train is soon going to accelerate. Tonight, they've all managed to get on board. Each of them has chosen their place to spend the night. Anthony has also managed to get on board. At the next station, the train slows down. For the time being, Zhao and his friends have managed to stay together. We managed to get on board. It's all good. Go on, guys. Move forward. We're better staying here. It's safer. If we get on the coaches, it's too dangerous. They ask us to leave. Our camera attracts too much attention. They are scared of being spotted and extorted. We've agreed to meet up further north in one of the stations where the freight train stops. It goes up to Mexico, towards the American border. But in the next stations, there is no sign of Antony or Jiao or their friends. We follow the railroad looking for them. Locals tell us that their train was intercepted by the Mexican police, but nobody has seen the children. Did they manage to escape? or have they been arrested? Because of pressures on migration, for a year, the south of Mexico has been under pressure. The roads are monitored by the police and the army. The United States have demanded that the Mexican authorities intercept migrants. This year, 11,000 children and teenagers traveling alone have been arrested on this route, a record. They are placed in temporary detention centers for minors, which today are packed and under high surveillance. I'm not allowed to speak to you, and you can't film here. Zhao and his friends are maybe in a center like this one in the north of the country. After lengthy negotiations, we managed to get access. Around 30 children and teenagers are locked up here at the moment. We can't talk to them or show their faces. All were arrested trying to illegally get to the United States, like Zhao, Anthony, and their friends. It's strange, it's like a prison for children. No. Really? No, not at all. Here the children are treated well. They're never treated as delinquents. They haven't committed any crime. But they can't leave. They can't leave for their own safety. The children can stay here for over a month. Then they are thrown out and are returned to their families. Back to the drawing board. Overrun by the influx of young migrants, the Mexican authorities are making the detention center bigger. Of course we have a security system in the whole establishment. It's to ensure that the children's stay goes well. It reassures the families. If Zhao, Anthony and their friends haven't been arrested, maybe they have reached the north of Mexico. The freight trains reach the United States in a month via three entry points, Nogales, Ciudad Juarez, and McAllen. We decide first to go to Nogales, looking for the teenagers. Once there, they would have to find a smuggler to cross the border between Mexico and the United States. Nogales, a city with a population of 200,000, under the control of drug cartels, who lead a relentless war. Human trafficking is their new business. A few days before we arrived, 10 migrants were killed and their smuggler decapitated. We check and it wasn't Joao or his friends. We ask many smugglers and after several days of negotiation, one of them finally accepts to let us accompany him. He goes by the name Daniel. He's 27, 
His speciality is teenagers. Hey, I want you to prepare everybody, okay? Get ready to leave. I'm on my way. He's just got out of prison, six months behind bars in the United States, arrested when he was smuggling migrants across the border. Tonight is his return to business, and he's stressed. The boss only pays me once the illegals arrive at their destination in the United States. For each migrant, I get $1,000. Once the children arrive at their families, the boss gives me my money. Daniel has worked for the Sinaloa cartel for six years, one of the most powerful in Mexico. He can earn up to $10,000 per week because he also smuggles drugs to the United States. We use the same routes to get them to the other side, and it's the boss who decides when we're taking drugs or illegals. Often the priority is drugs, so it's impossible to get any migrants through. On pain of death, illegals attract attention, they leave rubbish behind them. It's a good business, but the chickens, that's what we call the illegals, the chickens earn less than the drugs. Marijuana is worth a lot more. Drugs and migrants bring in over $3 billion each year for the Sinaloa cartel, never short of ideas to make a profit. Come on, come on, hurry up. The migrants who can't pay the cartel for their passage are forced to smuggle drugs to the United States. If they are caught, their trip ends in prison. OK, mission accomplished. Prison or death. The violence around Mexico's drug trade is reaching new and ever deadlier heights. In the last eight years, over 50,000 people have been killed in this war, which pits the Mexican cartels against each other. A war for the control of drug smuggling and now for migrants. They are capable of anything, violent and morally bankrupt and the migrants are their first victims. Another tragedy linked to illegal immigration. Nine migrants have been found dead. Has Nogales turned into a deadly trap for Zhao and Anthony? It's here that they had planned to cross the border. In Nogales, the Sinaloa cartel hides migrants in the region at the top of the city. The migrants stay here, in a hideout just at the end of this street. They must be waiting for me here. But you stay here, it's too dangerous. I'll go alone and come back with them, OK? Tonight, Daniel will have three people to get through to the United States. As planned, the cartel has given him minors. Go on, squeeze up in the back, all three of you. OK, we have a bit of a road to do, then we have to walk, OK? Juan and Jesus are cousins. They are 15 and are going to join their aunt in the United States. With them is Luis, 42 who's going to look for work over there. Where are you three going? Tucson. Yeah. And me, New York. I'll do my best for it to work. Once we're on the other side, a car will come and pick us up. It'll take you to hide in a house in the desert, and then we'll take you to your families. Now we're going to stop quickly to get supplies for the journey. You take the bag and the boot and put the shopping inside. I've got enough for everybody. Once they are on the other side, if they are seen by the American police, the group may have to hide out for a long time in the desert. What do you want to do in the United States? We want to work. Where we live, there's practically no work. On the other side, we'll do any work, anything to earn money. 
We'll have to be careful. Where we're going, the army and the cartel clash today, and I don't know what it will be like when we get there, if there'll be soldiers or guys from the cartel. We'll see what happens, if we can get through, and they let me do my job. It's 10 p.m. and the town is deserted. After an hour on the road, Daniel arrives at the crossing point. The lights in the distance are the United States, only a few kilometers away on the other side of the fence. Take a bag. Come so I can explain. Pay attention to the camera over there. We're going to go through there, hidden. We have to get to a place that I've picked out and stay to observe. To see if the American cops are waiting on the other side. OK, let's go. The group has to walk for nearly an hour in the dark. Daniel guides them to a spot in the fence where you can get through to the other side. Walk more over there, right behind me, so nobody can see you from the other side. Get down. He's afraid that henchmen from the Satus, the rival cartel, will spot them in the area. Sit down so nobody can see you. We're going to take a break here to see if we can hear anything like the noise of a car. It's tense. To be honest, I'm scared. I hope we're both going to get through. Don't be scared. Everything's going well, like I said. We can set off again. The fence is now less than a kilometre away, but the smuggler has stopped. He's worried. Guys, we're going to have to go on alone, because there are guys from the rival cartel over there, and if they see us together, they'll kill us. We're going to see if we can still get through, but it's tight. OK, let's go. Okay. Will they manage to get through? Once on the other side of the border, the group will have to walk for several kilometers to find the car that is waiting for them. Daniel has given us a meeting point in front of a service station on the road to Tucson. We also go through, legally, to the American side. This is the meeting point. Hours go by and the group doesn't appear. Daniel, the smuggler, doesn't answer his telephone. We check with the American authorities. That night, nobody was arrested. Two days later, and we still have no news of the two cousins, Juan and Jesus. We've lost all contact with Anthony, Zhao and their friends on the train. Did they get lost in the desert? It's our first theory. Here, tracks of young migrants heading to the United States disappear very quickly. At 45 degrees in the shade, you have to be very lucky to get out without dying of thirst, unless you come across one of the containers left by Eduardo. It's empty. Eduardo Canales has become the guardian angel of migrants in the Falfuras region. Each bottle serves two people. For five years, this human rights militant roams the roads of South Texas. In our region, migrants have started to die of thirst in the desert. Today, our priority is to stop this continuing. Thousands of migrants have died here over the last 10 years. Nobody knows exactly how many. 
the border states don't keep a record of how many bodies are found in the desert. Eduardo tells us that he hasn't seen the two cousins that we're following in the last 24 hours. However, in his little office, the files pile up. The last one that he just received is another migrant, found dead the night before in this desert that has become a cemetery. Here's what's left. At least the body was still whole. It's not often like that. Look, there's hardly the skeleton. Just a skull, in fact. And this body, the animals have already started to eat it. The reason he compiles hundreds of files is to help the families. At least half of the bodies found in the desert are never identified, unknown bodies. The families are desperate. They want to be able to mourn, but it's impossible. Over the last months, he's recorded more and more cases of young adolescents disappearing. I need to call a family who's asked for help. Their daughter has disappeared. She's 14 or 15, I think. This is a recent photo of her. Hello, it's Eduardo Canales. I'd like to ask you some questions. How was she dressed when she disappeared, do you remember? She was wearing a cream blouse. The young teenager who has disappeared is called Anayel. Her mother hasn't had any news for a month. Listen, I'm going to find out all I can about her in the area. Speak soon. It's very likely that cartels are keeping the young girl somewhere, especially as her mother says she's practically a woman. So they've perhaps taken her to abuse her. Disappeared, kidnapped, lost in the desert. We want to find out more. Anayel's mother agrees to meet us. She lives 800 kilometers away in Dallas, Texas. In this border state are over one and a half million illegal Latinos, families torn apart, who will do anything to bring over their children who have stayed behind in Mexico or Honduras. Juana, Anael's mother, has lived for 10 years in the United States, illegally. Since then, she has had two daughters. Although they were born in the United States, they are also illegal. Automatic citizenship doesn't apply to the children of illegal immigrants. Mom, doesn't my sister have a telephone to call us? No, she doesn't. If I had papers, I would go to fetch my daughter myself. I wouldn't have needed to ask a smuggler. And now, I can't even go to see where she's disappeared. When you're illegal, it's impossible. Juana is a chambermaid in a hotel in Dallas. She also illegally crossed the border 10 years ago. She had to leave her daughter, Anayel, four years old, with her parents in Mexico. It took her a year to save up to pay the smuggler to get back her eldest daughter, who she hasn't seen since. All the family had planned to celebrate Anayel's 15th birthday in a few weeks, but the teenager disappeared when crossing the border. She sent me this photo last May for Mother's Day in Mexico. The smugglers told me that the immigration police had arrested my daughter, but I called them. I asked everybody, but I still have no news. How much did you pay the smuggler? $2,000 for her to cross the border. And did the smuggler reimburse you? Of course not. They never give the money back. The two little girls have never seen their big sister apart from in photos. And today, they understand that the sister they wanted so much to know has disappeared. I wanted to play with her and sleep with her too. And how do you feel now? Bad. Because I wanted to see my big sister and she's lost. I hope we're going to find her. What becomes of all these little girls, these teenagers who disappear when they are in the hands of their smugglers? Anayel, a 14-year-old teenager, crossed the Mexican border at Ciudad Juarez, the second biggest entry point to the United States. 
one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Sadly, it's well known for its missing persons. During the 90s and 2000s, hundreds of Mexicans were sexually abused and killed here by Mexican cartels. Are young female migrants becoming the new missing persons of Juarez? Nobody here wants to talk about it because it touches on a very sensitive business run by the cartels, child prostitution. A smuggler who knows their methods well agreed to talk to us. When young migrants arrive here, many are forced into prostitution. The gang who runs that here, people are afraid to even say their name. But they are called the Aztecs. It's them who run the trafficking of illegals in this area. And I wouldn't want to have problems with them. <laughs> Antonio is a child smuggler. He was born here and has worked independently for over 10 years. He is only talking to us to condemn the behavior of his competitors. They buy and sell children even little boys, but especially girls, unfortunately. Those who want to cross the border without their help, they batter to death. It's horrible to see. All that right under the noses of the American cops over there, who are always patrolling. And don't forget that these gangs, they also traffic drugs. They traffic humans and drugs. In Ciudad Juarez, nearly a thousand women have disappeared since 2010 in these bars run by the cartels and forced into prostitution. How many migrants that their families never dare to come and get back? Ciudad Juarez may be the end of the journey for young Anayel who disappeared when she crossed the border. Her mother entrusted her to a smuggler so she wouldn't get arrested by the American border police. On the other side of the wall in the United States, the patrols never stop. Oh, he's moving. Yeah, those three, are, those, those three are gonna be sitting on the north side of the canal, just laying low. Tonight, the American officer, Cavillo from the border police, is responsible for surveillance of the wall just on the other side of Ciudad Juarez. Alrighty, thanks, bud. Officer Cavillo has just been called as backup with his colleague, Officer Leon. So right now we got three crossing uh, from Mexico illegally into the United States, but one of our- Steady, steady, steady on the incline. North of you. A chase ensues, a helicopter guides the vehicles towards the fugitives. And so the camera operator is talking to the agent. Uh, Keep on, going, you'll see him to your right there. On the ground, kind of like that uh, agent that we saw with the night vision. There's camera down, operators. Brother. Oh, they just made the apprehension. Oh, oh yeah, they're right there. Three, four, eight. They went over the river fence and uh, through the canal. The fence that we have up is solely to slow down the amount of people that, that, that come in. It buys us time to, to actually make the arrest. A fence that only slows down the migrants and their smugglers, but whose construction still costs over $4 million per kilometer and is watched constantly by 20,000 border control officers. And it's just a metal sheet and it goes all the way down, so the whole bottom is to prevent tunneling. We know tunneling will still happen, um, but it's just something to slow them down. The United States spends over $4 billion each year on stopping migrants from entering, but the cartels are always one step ahead. Tonight, you know, it's up and down. The, the traffic's coming and going. Some of the houses down there are stash houses, meaning they're areas where someone who's crossing the border illegally, they can get to that house, they'll allow them inside, and then they can just hide from us. Thank you. 
In 10 years, over a dozen militia like this one have been created along the border, a symptom of an American society that is becoming more extreme. Immigration has become the principal theme of the presidential campaign. The election that decides who will succeed Barack Obama will take place in a few months. One candidate has decided to stake everything on the subject, Donald Trump, billionaire, ultra-conservative candidate. We need to build a wall, and it has to be built quickly. Against him, Hillary Clinton, the Democrat who promises to defend the rights of illegal Latinos. The race to the White House is on, and two sides go head to head, legalization or status quo. The fate of 11 million illegal Latinos living in the United States is at the heart of the debate. Obama made a decision. By decree, he demanded the regularization of illegal immigrants who had arrived on American soil before 2007. A strong political choice. Challenged by the Republicans, this move has been blocked for over a year. We can do it. These illegal Latinos live in the United States, some of them for several years. They have come from all over the country. They gather in front of the New Orleans courthouse, which is going to pass judgment on the legality of Obama's decree. We need to show our, our strength, right? We need to show our numbers. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, it's going it's to show a lot. Right, Everywhere that we are. Illegal immigrants who go out in the street shouting that they are not afraid of being thrown out. It may look like nothing, but it's a first in the history of the United States. This ruling may change the lives of these parents and their children who are all illegal. Like John, nine, and Felipe, his dad. They live in California and have traveled over 3,000 kilometers to demonstrate. John was born in the United States, but he doesn't have any papers because his father entered illegally to find work. Right now, what we're trying to say is that even though we are not documented, we absolutely have no fear. We know that this documentation is going to come. We're not going to Where's sit it? aside. We're not going to be afraid. And important to be fighting. He's afraid of the police's arrest him. They want to be heard by the judges inside the courthouse. They are also American dreamers, illegal because they are the son and grandson of illegal immigrants. After four hours waiting, the audience is over. The judges have upheld the blockage of the decree the Republicans have won this round. Listen to me. We are going to appeal the judge's decision so that each person who is working, who has a family in this country, can stay here, legally, with us. They only have the American Supreme Court left to appeal to, to obtain their papers and give a future to their children. In the end, we'll win. We'll go to the Supreme Court if we have to. We'll fight to the end and we'll win. We deserve it. We've worked hard to get here. Keep trying. Come here. It's a good place to stay. Even. Even, even if it takes years to be here to get your papers, just stay here, you know. Obama's decree continues to arouse such hope today that even the most vulnerable are trying their chances. We go to meet them at McAllen, the eastern border of the United States. pregnant women, mothers and their young children, hundreds per day who cross the border with the aim of being arrested. They all come from Central America. They were arrested a few days ago when they tried to illegally enter the United States. I had to go through the river to cross the border and a border police car arrested us. My daughter and I couldn't take any more. Now we're going to New York to join my husband who's waiting for us. 
Clelia left El Salvador a month ago. She is free today because in the United States, the law prevents a mother and her young child from being locked up in a detention center. But their freedom has a price. It's the last measure to date that the American authorities have taken, an electronic tag. All the mothers wear them. It's because we have to appear before the judge and so they know exactly where we're going and if we leave the city, it starts to make a noise. With that on my ankle, I feel like I've done something bad, that I'm being watched all the time and I'm going to get arrested. Trying to control the stream of migration with electronic tags is a world first. Clelia, like the other mothers, is part of the first generation of trackable illegal immigrants, monitored by the authorities and locatable at all times by GPS. But Clelia has won some respite. A new life is starting. My daughter can study, learn English. It's a new start for us. She is leaving for New York to join her husband, who is also illegal. Will Clelia manage to stay in the United States with her daughter? A few weeks later, she got back in contact with us. She managed to join her husband, and they live in a New York suburb. He has lived here for over eight years, working as a cook in restaurants. We decide to go and find them. It's 5 a.m. and all the family are getting ready to leave. Sorry, I'm still a bit sleepy. I haven't slept all night. I hope that all will go well with the lawyer. Clelia will find out today if she has the right to stay in the United States. A lawyer has taken on her case free of charge. For the first time, she is going to his office in the center of New York with her electronic tag. I didn't manage to charge it completely overnight, so I'll have to take the cable. It's hard to see her treated like that. It means that she could be sent back at any moment. But I hope, with all my heart, that she can stay here with me. I hide it, otherwise people look at me strangely. Normally people who have a bracelet like that are criminals. So imagine how I feel. Come on, let's go. We're heading to Manhattan in the heart of New York, a two-hour train ride from the suburbs. Can Clelia go to New York with her bracelet on her ankle? It's 7.30 a.m. New York is waking up. Her new legal life seems almost within reach. It's incredible. The buildings here are huge. Everything here is so different. I want the lawyer to tell me that my case has a chance. I think my daughter will be able to get asylum. But for me, I'm really worried. The young lawyer who is defending her has received the reply from the American legal system on her case. If it isn't in her favor, Clelia may be forced to return to El Salvador and may even be separated from her daughter. It's the second time that she has tried to illegally enter the United States. We are not allowed to attend the interview. Forty minutes later, Clelia comes out. It isn't good news. The lawyer told me that they can deport me at any moment now. The decision has been taken. I perhaps have a chance thanks to my daughter. I'm going to demand asylum for her, and the law here says she can't stay without her mother, so that gives me a chance that they won't deport me. But it's going to be very hard. 
I'm disgusted. It's really hard. But we're going to fight. And if God's on our side, we'll manage. Another broken dream. This year, the United States has sent over 230,000 illegal immigrants back to their countries. A few months later, Clelia was still in New York with her husband, her daughter, and her electronic tag, but she hadn't yet received any notice of deportation. Joe and Anthony, who we lost track of on the train to Mexico, are alive and well. They were arrested heading north. They went back to Honduras and will try their luck again. Anael's mother still has no news of her daughter, who disappeared in Ciudad Juarez six months ago. Finally, the two cousins, Juan and Jesus, still nowhere to be found. More than 130,000 children and teenage migrants were arrested in the United States over the last two years. But how many others disappeared on the road to the American dream? <laughs>